Every superhero has a secret identity. I don't know a single one who doesn't. Fourteen years ago, my cousin and I went to see the latest Pixar movie at the time, The Incredibles. He was ten and I was eight years old. Obviously, like most other kids, we grew up watching Pixar movies. We were already huge fans of the stories they came up with, and we used to play Toy Story all the time on VHS. But The Incredibles always had a special place in our hearts, even though we were too young to properly express why that was. Fast forward 14 years later, and we started a matter of film. Since the sequel is about to come out this year, we decided to share our thoughts on why The Incredibles is considered by many to be the best Pixar movie ever made. Well, what are you waiting for? Me too, kid. The film opens with some very real 1950s era TV interviews with the big heroes of the time. Not unlike celebrities, they all seem happy to talk to the camera, but they all come across as a little self-absorbed, seeming rather obsessed with their own image. It's ironic that all of the heroes end up with much different lives after this interview. Super ladies. Frozone talks about superheroes but marries a normal girl. Elastigirl wants to continue fighting crime but ends up being more devoted to her family. And as for Mr. Incredible, he yearns for a normal life but ends up longing for more superhero action. It's funny how things can change. After this, we get a really fun throwback to the 1960s superhero action genre. The police work hand in hand with superheroes wearing colorful costumes that drive Batmobile type cars. Five minutes into the movie, and it's already apparent that this is a very maturely written movie. The banter between Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl feels very natural, where you can even feel the sexual tension between them. After the initial clash with Bon Voyage and Buddy, that's followed by quite a bit of destruction, the general public decides they're done with supers running around and make a law that decides all of them must go into hiding. It is time for their secret identity to become their only identity. This is a superhero movie for kids that begins with a lawsuit. Not even 10 minutes have passed and already important issues have been addressed. But this is just the opening. Some years have passed now. Bob and Helen Parr now live in a generic suburb with a generic lifestyle. Every day, Bob drives off to work in his beat up car he can't even fit in because he got incredibly fat. And his work is literally the most boring, soul-consuming office job you could possibly imagine. I'm not happy, Bob. Go save the world one policy at a time, honey. As for Helen, she has the job of the common 1950s-style housewife. She manages the home and the kids. One of the central conflicts in The Incredibles is that Robert, but also all former superheroes that we get to know, are living in a superficial shell of their former selves. Elastigirl can pretend all she wants, but none of them are truly happy with how their lives turn out. Why? Because no one is who they want to be. Robert and Lucius tell their wives that they go bowling, while the reality is they like to listen to the police radio looking for some action. How many of us are living as a shadow of our own past? Like those in our society that want to stand out, society has rejected them. Right now, honey, the world just wants us to fit in, and to fit in, we just gotta be like everybody else. Everyone's special, Dash. Which is another way of saying no one is. Again, this reflects the central themes of the film. It's not a graduation. He is moving from the fourth grade to the fifth grade. It's a ceremony. It's psychotic. They keep creating new ways to celebrate mediocrity, but if someone is genuinely exceptional... Is Society doesn't really like special. They like mediocrity. Mediocre makes everyone feel special. To do the extraordinary means making them feel miserable because being outstanding or successful acts as a spotlight shining down on their missed opportunities. You know... This conflict creates what would have been a nice tagline for the movie. The Pars have to save the day. But first, they have to save their marriage. About you! The filmmakers found creative ways to keep each character engaged, giving each one of them personal goals that still work to tell the story as a whole. Helen wants to take care of her family. Violet is shy and awkward and her powers reflect this. Dash likes to show off and just wants to compete in sports. But it's Bob 
who just wants to relive the glory days that is the most interesting character. He may be super, but he still has very human emotions. Like all of us, he's flawed. He has a short temper and constantly succumbs to his urges to relive the past. He's like so many of us, leading an average life, working at some bullshit job, living in a generic neighborhood, longing for freedom from the confinements of modern society. The filmmakers did an amazing job to portray human complexity such as Bob's midlife crisis, but also exploring the dark place that Bob goes to once he thinks his family is dead. He tries to grab Syndrome to kill him, but picks up his secretary instead and threatens to snap her in half. Oh, that sounds a little dark for you. Again, children's movie dwelling on some pretty dark stuff. Pixar managed to capture pain and what it can do to even the best of people. The use of color is very interesting in the film as well. There's a huge contrast between the office, which is gray and boring, and the island, which is very bright and beautiful. While Bob's office may seem like the safest place in the world where no one will kill him, Sit down, Bob. it's really the most dangerous in terms of his soul and the damage it does to it. While the island is quite literally the home of all evil in the film, it's the most beautiful place there is. This represents the idea that this place is where Bob feels the happiest. For him, this is the most beautiful place in the world because he gets to be a hero again. Showtime. This is where Bob exposes himself to the biggest danger he has faced in his entire life, but it's also the place where he can finally be himself and do the things that he loves. Maybe the beauty of this place lies only in our main character's sense of adventure, of being in the face of true danger one more time. There's this moment later in the film when the family finally comes together as a team on the beach, which is great because it's where we realize that being a loving family doesn't mean you have to stop kicking some ass. It's the first moment in the film where all the characters finally get what they wanted. But so does the audience. Time out! And when everyone's super... <laughs> no one will be. Buddy represents all evil in the world. In this movie, he's quite literally the bad guy that kills all superheroes. In real life, he's represented by the corporations, by the educational system, or by anyone that tries to drown the voice of anyone that's special. Buddy represents mediocrity, the very idea that everyone should be the same, so people don't feel bad about themselves because they're mediocre too. The Incredibles is a very special movie because it wasn't just for kids. 14 years ago, it was a fun, animated superhero movie. Rewatching it as adults, it definitely still is all those things. But the appreciation now also comes from being able to deal with incredibly mature themes while still appealing to kids. It managed to balance a personal, emotional story with big action. It has some of the best characters ever put to screen. And as usual, Pixar pushed the boundaries of computer animation, with a cartoon about a dad with superpowers going through a midlife crisis. And they succeeded in every way possible. But above all, The Incredibles is a film that rejects the 9 to 5 office mentality. It rejects being average, being like everybody else. It's an important movie that asks us to go out there and do the things that actually make us happy. To do the things that we love. When you look closely at the seams between order and chaos, do you see the same things I see? The strain, the tears. The glimpses of truth hidden underneath. Why do they fight so desperately to mask what they are? Or is it that they become who they are when they put on the mask? Sometimes I wonder what you hide behind. What mask do you wear? Or are you just as afraid as the rest of them? Hey guys, we're almost at 10,000 subscribers. We have a special surprise prepared for you that we'll release when we get there, so make sure to stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. And if you're new to the channel, welcome. Subscribe for great videos like this one every Monday. See you next week, guys.